Even though we generally like letting markets drive the economy, we are often dissatisfied with some of the specific results. We are always complaining about the high price of essential things like gas, housing, or medical care, or we're dissatisfied with low wages or depressed stock prices. We also sometimes think that people engage in distasteful or dangerous activities that should be curtailed. So, as a society, we are always faced with proposals to rein in certain markets in order to get different results. We have several methods for managing marketplaces, taxes, subsidies, price controls, and prohibition. In addition to raising revenue, we often impose taxes to discourage something that we don't like or want people to consume less of. A tax effectively raises the cost of something. A tax on the sale or production of something raises the supply curve. This moves market equilibrium up along the demand curve to a point where the price is higher and less is produced and consumed. A subsidy, on the other hand, encourages something that we'd like to see more of, like education or home ownership. A subsidy is a payment or a tax relief from the government in return for doing or buying something we think has some extraordinary social benefits. Subsidies have the opposite effect of taxes because they make things less expensive. A subsidy paid to consumers raises the demand curve since what they're willing and able to pay now includes a payment or tax break from the government. The market equilibrium is now at a higher price and a greater quantity. A subsidy paid to producers lowers the cost of production by the amount of the subsidy. The supply curve shifts out, pushing prices down and increasing the quantity produced and consumed. If we think the market price itself is causing problems, we might try to regulate it. For example, utility prices, like electricity and water, are usually tightly controlled to avoid destructive volatility. Price floors limit how low prices can go. To be effective, the price floor must be set above the natural market price. Price floors ensure that at least a certain minimum price can be earned. Their drawback is that they induce producers to supply more than consumers will buy. Thus, a surplus can persist. The minimum wage and farm price supports are examples of price floors. Alternately, price ceilings keep prices from rising too high. The ceiling price must be set below the unregulated market price to be effective. Price ceilings ensure that no one is charged more than the ceiling price. Their main downside is that this leads to shortages since suppliers won't provide enough to satisfy consumers at the regulated price. This can often lead to black markets. Many communities use ceilings to control the prices of electricity and other utilities, sometimes to control rents. Price controls are also used to limit price gouging of essential commodities during natural disasters. As a last resort, we use prohibition to make it illegal to own, hold, move, buy, or sell something we think has inordinately bad side effects. Prohibition is effectively a large tax that takes the form of expenses to avoid getting caught and costs associated with working in a lawless environment. As with any tax, prohibition moves market equilibrium up along the demand curve, leading to higher prices and less consumption than before. However, prohibition is generally synonymous with that failed attempt to ban alcohol in the 1920s. In reality, there are many less colorful examples of prohibited activities that didn't generate such violent problems. Some commonly prohibited or highly restricted activities include riding a motorcycle without a helmet, driving while talking on a phone, 
driving or buying a car without a seat belt. Markets are wonderfully efficient tools to reconcile our wants and needs with our ability to produce things. However, they are not perfect and we're often faced with undesirable side effects. In these cases, we need to consider if it's worth interfering with market forces, and if so, how should we do it?